So I'm here today with Professor John Davis, who's a professor of economics at Marquette University um, and also a professor of the history and methodology of economics at the University of Amsterdam. Um, and he's also one of our INET inaugural grantees with a very interesting project um, titled The Methodology of Systemic Risk, which I find a little obscure, um, but I've just reviewed it, and it's a really quite a fascinating uh, sort of study that he's planning to do. Um, he's turning the lens of economic research on economists themselves um, to try to understand how economists uh, reason or think, or at least that's what I get out of it. Um, John, welcome. Thank you. Um, this herding behavior, okay, which seems to be the central idea here in this grant, um, tell, tell us what that's about. Well, one way you can talk about systemic risk is that people uh, all behave in a similar or like fashion. If that's how we understand the herding idea. It's a, a kind of a shared or uh, same pathway adopted uh, systemically, and in this case, in the entire economics profession. So are you talking about an asset bubble? No, an asset bubble is what you would associate with herding behavior in the financial community, but you might talk about a research bubble the same idea, a herding behavior where people copy or imitate or follow the leader, uh, a certain set of research cues or models or theories, and you reduce diversity and alternative uh, views in the uh, profession and research that might represent uh, uh, unexploited ideas and uh, important policy uh, foundations for important policy alternatives. A research bubble. <laughs> so your thought is to study the economics profession. Is this a contemporary economics profession? It is the, it is the contemporary economics okay. profession, but the study of professions uh, is not a new uh, type of research. Uh, it's often referred to as the sociology of scientific knowledge. And we look at the practices of people in physics, chemistry, biology, the natural sciences, the social sciences, psychology, economics, uh, political science perhaps, and we look at how the conditions under which research is produced for people in terms of their professional locations influences the content or the character of the research that they generate. So this herding behavior is common not just in economics but in physics and in the other social sciences? That's right, it could be. It's, it could be more significant in one or another. It would depend on the a particular character of the discipline. Economics is a bit uh, unique uh, relative to some of the natural sciences in the ways in which policy uh, feeds back onto the production of research. If you can imagine a policy for physics and natural science, the feedback loop is uh, less tight, and so the research perhaps uh, uh, bubbles, if you like, in different ways. How are you going to find this out? Do you do do you study citation patterns or what what is what how do you how would you know if there was a research bubble? Citation patterns is an important part of it. Yeah. We're also looking at PhD production. The way in which people go into positions reflects the leadership of the most prestigious universities such as Harvard, MIT, Princeton. And so their students typically become the first hired when new positions become open. So if the training of those PhDs uh, is filtered down, so to speak, into uh, another tier of institutions where PhDs are trained, you get kind of a, you might say a cascade effect, uh, effects one place in the training process communicate to effects elsewhere. And so you might talk, if not strictly about herding, kind of nonetheless a, a, a inertial pattern of uh, development of research in the broad sense. Then the way research is evaluated in terms of journal location and uh, the citations that uh, uh, articles receive has much to do with the, uh, the weight that journals have in the mm -hmm. citation process. And so you have at the farther end of the story, after you've got the research being produced, a uh, validation uh, story that also contributes. So we look at these different kinds of things together and uh, try to understand uh, more monolithic uh, tendencies in the development of economics research. Now you keep saying we, so I know this is a joint project with Wade Hands, yes. um, but are there other people involved in this as well? What we have proposed to do is run a 
not a conference, but something much smaller, a workshop, which is a fairly small, intensive interaction over two days with uh, a dozen to maybe 15 or as many as 18 people participating. So we want to essentially introduce a new feedback loop, a type of reflection on the practices economists uh, engage in, a kind of reflexivity to reflect the Soros theme, mm -hmm. where uh, we don't just do research, we ask ourselves how we do research and see if that influences the way we do research. So this group is, is sort of turning the camera back on, on the economics profession. Um, so one of the deliverables eventually might be some reform of the way journals work. or So it might, might have some policy implications. Yes, that's correct. It's, a, it's, it's not policy in the traditional sense where we think about, uh, well, uh, how perhaps to change fiscal and monetary policy at national economy level. It's policy about uh, education and the conditions under which we produce people who then deliver policy uh, such as fiscal and monetary. So it's education policy or profession policy right. and that's, that's not an easy thing to target actually. Is it the financial crisis that gave you the idea to do this or where, where, did this, or does, where does this come from in your own life? It is exactly the financial crisis. Uh, when I made the proposal to INET, I read, had just read John Author's book on the financial crisis, and he talked about hurting behavior among people in the financial investment community, pension fund managers, hedge fund managers, and so on. And it occurred to me that the people working in that location uh, have been trained essentially in the same way as people in the economics profession, that we share sort of a common set of views about what the content of the, the uh, economy is in an analytical manner. And so we have many of the same uh, responses to events. And the hurting that we now see as a, as a key problem in financial markets uh, could also be understood in terms of the broader uh, educational research program of hurting uh, in the economics and financial mm -hmm. economics communities. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that we're interested in here in INET is, in fact, sort of fostering new economic thinking, even e thinking about the economy by people who aren't economists. Um, and so you're particularly interesting from this point of view because you have this whole, uh, I was just looking at your CV, you, you, you did philosophy before you did economics, um, even a PhD in philosophy. Okay, tell me, tell me about that. So you were initially, you, be, you came to economics through philosophy, is that right? That's right. I studied philosophy first and then I thought it was a bit too ivory tower. I was interested in the application of theory of knowledge or reasoning about uh, uh, truth and explanation in economics. That's an identifiable field in economics called methodology of economics or sometimes philosophy of economics. It's a fairly active field with a lot of uh, talented uh, people. There is a lot of crossover to other fields, philosophers in particular. And uh, also there's people increasingly in uh, sociology, uh, in communication studies, who have looked at the way in which ideas are created and developed. So, but I want to return to this intriguing point that you said that you, philosophy was too ivory tower for you, okay? And so after doing a PhD in philosophy at, uh, at the University of Illinois, is yes. that right? Um, you moved on to do a whole other PhD in economics. Um, so you weren't discontent, you, were, you weren't dissatisfied. Okay, you've now trying to bring them together in your life, is that right? I also often advise students on career tracks. And uh, so I speak from my own experience. And that is, is that uh, if you're simply doing a single area of research, there's, as economists say, diminishing returns because the topics and problems have been so heavily investigated with such a rich, vibrant academic community as we have in the United States. So people in uh, research and educational policy at the national level in many countries have tried to push cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, more pluralistic types of research. So I was stimulated to try to bring together insights from philosophy, which I thought were relevant, to economics. And it, it was, in fact, quite specific, it turned out, to Keynes, because Keynes was in philosophy first, and he wrote a set of papers now referred to as the Apostles' papers in his early undergraduate years, which were 
only discovered and discussed about 10, 15 years ago, and then moved into economics. So Keynes, like you, started in philosophy and moved into economics. And like Smith and Marx as well. And really? Like, and uh, you might add Amartya Sen to that, uh, that picture. Well, this is really a very interesting approach to economics, quite, quite unusual, um, and we're glad to have it in our stable and welcome you to our team of INET economists. Thank John you. Davis. Thank you. Thank you.